everybody to the lion's den it's been a while i am very honored to have deacon enoch thank you so much uh, you had me on on your channel back in the day i'm very i'm very honored to have you on the lion's den thank you for coming bro my pleasure shalom lok salam alaikum it's it's very interesting you were on my channel prior to the founding of my philosophy of art and science podcast i had back then the tawahado bible study and mm. so I tried to narrow your focus, I remember, to scriptural topics. But then I was like, there are so many other topics that we're going to be discussing, too. So I just separated them into two podcasts, which you can imagine is is kind of hectic. But uh, I noticed you were on a show with a, a bunch of great Internet intellectuals recently, too. And you had a brother Elijah on there and a brother Enoch. I'm named after both of them. That's my name and my father's name. So that was kind of crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. They're they're real. They wish that was, those were their real names. Their real names you have been for us. But oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's yeah. my real name. Yeah, <laughs> those are my real name. My dad, who has never been a consistent churchgoer in his life, insisted. My mother wanted me to be Caleb. My father insisted. His first son be uh matching with him the two people who didn't die in the bible oh, so the undying funny. ones yeah <laughs> absolutely that's amazing um i'm gonna link your channel in the description thanks for reminding me the name uh and from the title i had the title i had it saying at the end holy psalm because i i knew it was a cognate between our languages uh, i think from the the Ge'ez and the aramaic and the arabic it's all the same word uh, but some of the people in the comments didn't know what psalm was so i was like let me just put it length and then we'll talk about it um, oh, that's yeah yeah that's interesting yeah yeah, yeah, yeah we and, call it um Ab so okay the great, the great fast i've seen other people do that too i've seen some people i think picking up from saint vladimir's do great lent which i think lent has a totally different etymology so i try to say either lent for kind of Western audience people. And then yeah. if we want our own, yeah, uh, the great fast. But yeah, Psalm is like Salat or Salot. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> many, many, many uh, cognates, even even like, uh, you know, the um, the Muslims are fasting too right now, right? Uh, Masjid or Masjid, uh, I've heard right. different with the G or the J. Yes. And uh, mine is, uh, oh, nice, shout out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we got some uh, shout outs already. <laughs> and we, we have a similar dynamic with some of the words in our, our language. And that root is the same, the, the root to prostration. Yeah, so it's sujood, exactly. Mm -hmm. So for, um, for the Tigrinya, uh, they say the same word that Amhara use is yes. salt. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because it's a giz word. It's not actually an Amhara. Right. It's very funny. Um, unless you speak to someone who knows languages precisely, you know, you'll get somebody that tells you like Chow is Spanish, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or worse, Chow is Amharic, where it's yeah, Italian, you know, they're loan words and not everybody, um, even understands that. Like I was doing my Amharic of the day was this word Matreyas, and even I wasn't sure about it, but I definitely didn't boldly say it was pure Amharic. A friend stepped in and said, here's the Mitrayus, which is, it's a French loan word. We have another one that a Syrian friend told me, and, and it means automatic uh, rifle, by the way, a similar one that we say, Kamenja. And a Syrian, uh, a Damascene friend told me that they use that word too, but he said they have a different word, but he's like in old movies, they still say it. And that's a Turkish ah, loan word. Okay. So like, the, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. Psalm, for... Psalm is Semitic. Yeah. Yes. We all say Psalm. I, uh, the Aramaic, they add a, 
they say soma with the a at the end then arabic is so i had it on there. feminine right is that just feminine? no the or... feminine would be if it had a t in there like some type but so is masculine it's masculine yeah even in arabic if you notice if if you know the a feminine word it will have a tamarbuta which is a soft a t that you don't hear it unless it becomes possessive so all the fem most of the time the feminine words have a t we have uh, that too. In Guz, it, it often ends in a T like that for feminine, but there mm -hmm. on some also, I guess it's, I think it's possessive when it's A, like if it belongs to her. I see. Okay. So it was very close. I think maybe you guys read though from left to right. Yes. Yeah. That's what yeah. makes us unique. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 cool. If you want to nerd out with it, like one of the funniest examples is you have this biblical Aramaic word, um, which I have like a cousin with this name, Ruhama. And hmm. it's the same from the opening of the Quranic Arabic, the Araman Arahim. And you have RHM. And if you read that from right to left, RHM, that's mercy, right? Or different synonyms for the word mercy. If yeah. you read it from left to right rather than right to left, it becomes MHR. And that's that's our word for mercy. Um, Mehrat, um, oh. there's a T ending right there for you. Okay. Mahari, um, actually, one of the scholars I'll quote today, his name is Mahadi, and it's this it's this root for Uruhama. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, this is exciting. Uh, let's get started, huh? Yeah, let's get started. So um, what I wanted to begin with you is I, um, I just wanted to, first of all, appreciate how much uh, how many myriad of myriad podcasts you've been on prior to starting <laughs> your own show. And so I think you set the groundwork for anyone wanting to kind of follow a similar model is just i think you weren't trying to like monetize asap or anything you were doing it just for kind of the love of god and um i i heard you talking it really touched my heart with your uh, the friends the other intellectuals that we're talking about about how you kind of got to be known as the defender of the non-calcedonian or properly the miaphysite position but that you were kind of more at home reading the writings of Mar Ephraim and Mar uh, Jacob of Sarug mm. and studying scripture and patristics, even with and inviting Maronites and, and Chaldeans. And that that is like the heart of what I like to do, too. I add, of course, St. Yared and Abba Georgis to the list. But the yeah. Syriac is uh, very close to my heart in addition to my um, Giz fathers. I consider the Syriac fathers my fathers as well. Of course, Absolutely. the Coptic ones, too. I just tend to identify more with the Syriac ones, but the, the mm -hmm. you know, I, I think um, monastically and poetically, because we retain the Semitic languages more, mm -hmm. whereas Coptic is within the Afro-Asiatic, for the first thousand years, they were really influenced by by being um, really a Greek colony, you know. Yeah, while, well, Hellenic, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I always tell Hellenic. any any Habasha who would listen to me, I always tell them, we are kin, like the the Surai, Assyrian, Syriac, Aramean, whatever you want to call these people, us and the the Habasha from uh, East Africa, the Semitic speaking, um, um, you know, if you're in Ethiopia or Eritrea, the, that we have some link there. The way our ethos is, the framework of the way we think, our spirituality is very close. If you read our stuff, we read your stuff, We we know what to do with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. We're not lost. It, and it's it's very funny, actually. Um, my that same Damascene friend of mine, he's a room, so he's a Greek Orthodox. But he was even telling me one day I kind of look like one of his cousins, and that was kind of cracking me up. I was like, that might be a bit much. I might be slightly darker than one of his cousins. But what's going on there is like even it's not just the linguistics and the church, like the genetics. I've come to be more interested in genetics as well, and. Um, there's a website illustrative that gets you mix and match DNA and you mix ancient populations and modern populations, see what the closest to you is. So for those who know basketball fans like Manut Bol, which is like <laughs> the closest to me they have in the East African hunter gatherer side, you take a Nilo Saharan, which is a Manut Bol, and then you take a Levantine person and that's, that's Habasha. Habasha is roughly half Manut yes. Bol, half Levantine. I like that. So, you know, it's funny. We have uh, in my parish, Syriac Orthodox, we have like, uh, you know, it ranges from like blonde hair, blue eyes, mm -hmm. like super dark people. And it's just one ethnic group there. Um, I don't know why there's a difference in pigmentation, 
when we see Habasha, we think they're us until we go and talk to them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, you know, it, it, we, we give options. Either they're us or they're like Yemeni or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I have some friends, especially like, for example, an Eritrean friend. She fooled my Damascene friend because she grew up in Saudi. And yeah. So, uh, and, and also, by the way, to, yeah, yeah. So oh, she speaks, wow. She speaks Hejazi Arabic. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. And then on top of that, in Tigrinya, they say marhaba, too. So even mm -hmm. like the greeting is <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, it, there are funny cases like that. But I wanted to share with you to um, get us to a kind of the holy place. I started with your emphasis on Ephraim because we have this thing you may have heard of before. Some people call it the Theodokia. It's called Wadasi Maryam, which is the praise of, of Maryam, of Mary. Mm -hmm. And um, it is attributed to St. Mary. Um, excuse me. They're odes to St. Mary in between every stanza, but a lot of it is incarnational and Trinitarian doctrine, and you'll see that. This is just the Wednesday's portion I'm gonna present for you. Um, thank you, God bless. Um, so let me share this. And um, can you see it? Right here. A hymn of praise for the fourth day of the week, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You're able to see it? Yes. Okay. So I think we can switch back and forth on, on stanzas, but basically it's attributed to St. Ephraim. And whether, you know, the veracity of that claim is, is difficult to find. But like you were saying, you could kind of, you know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if at the end of it, we could get a, a judgment for you if it at least is in the Ephraim school, if not directly. It, Ephraim. I'm, already, I'm already telling you it is. I'm looking okay. at it right away. So all right, okay. and, and all I'll that. do the first That's stanza how... and we'll, we'll go back and forth. And so each after each stanza, we say Sa'adi, uh, this, this Sa'adi is the same. Uh, root word as the word Saul. It's to ask or to plead or to pray, right? Okay. So pray for us, holy woman or saint. Yeah. So all the hosts of the heavens say, Blessed art thou, O thou second heaven upon the earth, door of the sunrise or the east. Mary the virgin, thou pure bride chamber of the holy bridegroom. The father looked down from heaven and found none like unto thee. He sent his, ho his only one and he became incarnate of thee. All generations so ascribe blessings unto thee, thou who alone art our lady, the bearer of God. Pray for us, holy woman. Great and wonderful things have the prophets prophesied concerning thee, O city of God, for thou art the abode of all those who rejoice. All the kings of the earth walk in thy light, and all the nations in thy splendor. Pray for us, holy woman. I'll give you another one that was short. <laughs> <laughs> O Mary, all generations shall ascribe blessings unto thee, and shall worship him who was brought forth by thee, and shall magnify him. All of them, thou art in very truth the cloud, and thou hast shown us the water of the rain, the sign of the only begotten. The Father established thee, the Holy Ghost took up his abode on thee, and the power of the Most High overshadowed thee. O Mary, and verily thou didst bring forth the word, the Son of God, who endureth forever. He came and hath delivered us from sin. Great was the honor that was bestowed upon thee, O Gabriel, the angel of the Annunciation, with the joyful face. Thou didst proclaim unto us the birth of the Lord who hath come to us, and thou didst announce him to Mary, the spotless virgin, and didst say unto her, Rejoice thou, O thou who art full of grace, God is with thee. Pray for us, holy woman. Thou didst find grace, the Holy Spirit dwelt upon thee, and the power of the Most High overshadowed thee, O Mary. Verily thou didst bring forth the Holy Savior for all the world. He came and he hath delivered us. Pray for us, holy woman. Our tongue this day praiseth the work of the Virgin. We praise Mary, the God-bearer. Because our Lord and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, was born of her in the city of David. Come, O all ye nations, and let us ascribe blessing unto Mary, for she is at once mother and virgin. Rejoice, O pure virgin, in whom there is no blemish, to whom came the word of the Father who was incarnate of her. Rejoice, O vessel, unblemished, perfect, and spotless woman. Rejoice thou, O garden, endowed with reason. Thou abode of Christ, who became the second Adam because of the first Adam, the man. 
Rejoice thou, O woman, who borest the only begotten, who having gone forth from the bosom of his father, suffered no change. Rejoice, O thou pure bride chamber, who art adorned with all the beauty of praise. He came and was not consumed by the fire of the Godhead. Rejoice thou, O mother and maid, virgin, thou second heaven, who didst carry in thy body him who is born aloft by the cherubim and seraphim. And because of this we rejoice and we sing with the holy angels with joy and gladness and we say glory to God in the heavens and peace upon earth, his good will to men. For he unto whom belong glory and praise forever and ever is well pleased with thee. Amen. Pray for us, holy woman. The glory of Mary is greater than that of all the saints, for she was worthy to receive the word of the Father, him who maketh the angels to be afraid, him who the watching angels in heaven praise, did Mary the virgin carry in her womb. She is greater than the cherubim and superior to the seraphim, for she was the ark or tabernacle of one of the Holy Trinity. She is Jerusalem, the city of the prophets, and she is the habitation of the joy of all the saints. On the people who sat in darkness and the shadow of death hath a great light risen. God who resteth in his holiness became incarnate of a virgin for our salvation. Come ye and look upon this marvelous thing and sing ye his song because of the mystery that hath been revealed unto us. For he who was become a man, the word mingled with our nature, he who had no beginning assumed a beginning for himself, and he who had no days reckoned to himself days, and he who could not be known became revealed, and he who was invisible showed himself. The Son of the living God became a man, indeed Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever, one nature, him do we worship and praise. Pray for us, holy woman. Ezekiel the prophet testified concerning her and said, I see a sealed door in the east, sealed with a great and wonderful seal, and no one save the God of the mighty ones hath gone in through it. He went in and he came out. Uh, this door. Oh, oh this, sorry, sorry. I should have added. I missed a stanza there. Yeah, sorry. Some of it is still choppy. I'm, I'm getting it from somewhere else. Just pray for us, holy woman. Pray for us, holy woman. This door is the virgin who brought forth for us the redeemer. She brought him forth, and she remained in her virginity after she had brought him forth. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, O God bearer, who came and delivered us out of the hand of the enemy who was merciless. Complete art thou, and blessed. Thou hast found grace with the King of glory the God and truth, majesty and glory belong to thee more than to all those who dwell upon the earth. The word of the Father came and was incarnate of thee and walked about with men, for he is compassionate and a lover of men. He delivered our souls by his holy coming. Pray for us, holy woman. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's kind of choppy and this translation, I don't know where it's from. Someone shared it in like our Holy Virgin Mary uh, Parish Facebook group like more than a decade but it's ago. beautiful man that's yeah. so beautiful I'll, I'll 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 send you this one and i'm i'm gonna come up with my my own i do polish some of these translations from time to time i'm gonna send you my own but yeah i wanted to get your thoughts on if it's in the ephraim school i, I feel like it, we have stuff that is almost identical if not identical um it, it's uh, if you didn't tell me that this was from your right i would have thought this is from ours um, it's, it's pretty much the same, even the same themes, the same titles, the same way of thinking, the whole emphasis on the bridal chamber, at second Adam, we call her the second Eve. Yeah, same. Uh, all of that. Yeah, for sure. And then we have the thing too, where it's like, there's the, the stanza and then there's the, what do you call the refrain or the chorus, whatever. It's the same. It's because it's a uh, Semitic languages are poetic languages. They're intended to be chanted. Um, so uh, naturally, like whereas, say, if you're writing um, the Divine Comedy by Dante, for example, is Latin. So he had to make that into a poem. Our languages naturally are poetic. We have to try to not let them be. You know. We yeah, can do a lot of play on work. It's um, it, it's a good point you made too. Is that um, we kind of just read it because it's the English version and the melodies haven't been properly trained yet. Exactly. So, 
and and that that is a way in which many of the faithful use these prayers every day for there's a, a portion of these Marian prayers or Wudasi Mariam for every day of the week but in addition to that uh, the scholars of the church actually like have a full chant for it and it's elongated and in case um, I guess I can share it with you and then maybe we could share it with people it, it's hard to navigate so sometimes I hesitate sharing things like that but it's called eat the book the uh, the weird thing is they keep the T uh, for eat and the the same but <laughs> eat the book.org for anyone watching if you just click around on there <laughs> That you will hear some of these melodies that are That's recorded insane. for people on there. It it does kind of take some literacy in is to navigate the website, so I apologize for that. But if you click around, you can hear some stuff. You know, um, uh, when I started getting into this stuff a long time ago, maybe a decade now, uh, I would I would read you know the the translations of our prayers and just pray them that way by reading. Mm -hmm. But it's a completely different experience when you're chanting these ancient uh, melodies and you're you're chanting it in the original language because then you don't need to worry about a translation you need only to worry about um all of these things and then the words the play on words is, is still there it's staying the same um the meaning is there it's intended so one day i was talking to an orthodox jew and i was telling him about how we're translating our stuff and he's like don't translate <laughs> he's like leave it let make everybody learn the language because it's going to get lost that way and he's right about that i he's think he's absolutely right. right in um let alone in hebrew in Ge'ez and amharic for example you hear the story of isaac and isaac the word to laugh in amharic and in okay. is is masak yeah it's, it's isaac yeah. so you hear it and you don't get that in your english translation and uh even in the, the cousin semitic tongues you, you can hear it yeah i was on a show with william the other day um he had uh, a couple protestants on and they were saying like what do you mean you guys don't translate the part in your bible where it says you know when jesus raises the little girl the Talitha yeah, this it doesn't say so. It, it translated means little girl, get up. It says it in their Bible. Yeah. In our Bible, it doesn't say that because we already know what it is. It's obvious. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and for us, Talita doesn't mean anything. But Kumi, you, that literally is the Amharic command for a girl to stand up. I see. But it, what's weird is I've heard, for example, uh, you guys use that for the resurrection. We use a yeah. different verb for the resurrection, one that is Tansa'a. Um, and and even for example when the deacon says stand up for prayer it's it's this tansa and that's the same one but we also have this um comma in fact the staves that people see us using all the time i'm sure they love the our prayer staves it's called mm -hmm. makomia or the thing that helps you stand awesome yeah and then even like when we hear the word Emmanuel, emmanuel amman with us el god so we we know what these names are meaning because they're in our languages you know it's uh thank god thank robel god. is saying i'm far from my mic could you not hear me i can get closer but i thought well, they were thought talking you about you me. i thought they were talking about or me is it you or me i don't know <laughs> i'm i'm pretty close <laughs> they said that to me on reason in theology too and i was like man i'm pretty close it's pretty loud i could hear myself in the headphones that's why guys whose audio is it that that is not the best right now oh it was it was deacon okay okay um okay uh all right so uh saint georgis we say in aramaic georgis and in, in amharic uh yeah. i would love to hear about him his, yes. his, uh, i keep hearing of him but i don't know much and i'm excited for to hear what you have to say well i'm so glad that you've been hearing about him mm -hmm. so what I'll do first is I'll shout out the scholar Augustine Dickinson. He already has his master's degree, which he got um, while he was in Canada. And that was on, for those interested, kind of the magic scroll tradition um, mm. in Ethiopia and demon warding manuscripts and things like that. Um, but his current study, he's at the University of Hamburg that produces a lot of uh, scholarship on good studies, is on something called the Malk tradition. 
And actually, mm. Gorgias Press has a book coming out with another scholar I'm going to mention, Professor Hafta Mikhail Kidani. He's a, an Eritrean Catholic um, Capuchin uh, affiliation. I'm not sure if he's still active with the Capuchins, but he, um, he has a whole book on this Malk. And the word Malk, it means like the image or the likeness of somebody. Mm. And um, it's, it's different from the sacred uh, heart theology, but there's something similar there. It's rhyming poems that are made to the various body parts of the saints. And so um, this is from uh, Augustine Dickinson has a page. Oh, by the way, speaking of Augustine, I should have said you had one of the funniest lines ever. I don't know if it was our, our conversation or I've heard you in so many different places about how the Syriac didn't even know who, you know, the historic St. Augustine was yes. until 800 <laughs> years le later. But I will tip my hat to uh, St. Augustine today because he said when you sing or when you chant, it's like you're praying twice. And that, that goes along with everything that you were saying. Yeah. But the, the current um, scholar who's closer to our age, Augustine Dickinson, has a page called Arke uh, Lalla Samunu, which has these malks or these, these types of uh, body part praising um, poems. And here's one about Abba Georgis that I'll share. And, and again, um, in his hagiography, they use the word saint. But typically, uh, when people talk about him, they just call him Abba, which again is the Aramaic as well for father, yeah. and it's Giz for father. Mm -hmm. um, when we say Abuna, we usually say that for our bishops. It, it na just makes it our, our father, but it's the same. Like in, in when we remember our patriarchs in the and our bishops in the liturgy, we we just call them Abba, and it, so it just means you know father. So we call him like. Abba Georgis, which means Father George, and we say of Sagla, which is the town that he's from. Sometimes, and I'm, I'm not sure why, the town has an alternative name of Gasicha. So you may hear Gasicha or Sagla, and it's mm. the town that he's from in the in, in what is today the Amhara region. Back then, um, these regions had different names. Um, but let me share my screen again, and then I will um, read. It's a very short poem that I'll uh, read for you. So this is again from Augustine Dickinson's place and um, on Facebook. It's um, let me actually I have the link up here. Then I'll send it to you later so that people could go. It's facebook.com slash is poetry. Very easy to remember slash is poetry. So here it is kind of side by side with the goods. I'll just read the English when the accursed and it rhymes in goods. It doesn't rhyme in <laughs> English. <laughs> we went over that point when the accursed plant of deception was broken off from the root of the garden. They appointed Matthias as a servant in place of him. In order that their number not be reduced, he was added, for he was chosen by casting lots to become an evangelizer, making a heavenly appointment as a teacher in wisdom who preaches the Nazarite son. So you see them kind of in the poem analogizing him coming out almost of nowhere to... Um, get rid of bad teachings and to kind of have this Edenic paradise restored. What I can say about him, I will say from, as I mentioned the root earlier, there's a Deacon Mahadi who's a PhD candidate right now uh, mm. about to defend his dissertation at the Catholic University of America. And he's, he's in our church, in the Orthodox Church. He has a forthcoming dissertation, which so it's not released, probably won't be released for a couple of years, but I got permission from the author for the lion's den to i told oh. him it was going to be on the lion's den and he gave me permission to preview chapter two which gets into the narrative of abba Georgis of sagla the entire thing is kind of his analysis of his works but it's titled 15th century ethiopian orthodox ecclesiology in Georgis of, Georgis of Sagla's Mas 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 Mister. and masafa Mister means the book of mystery it's one of his um, many works he has a book called Inzira Sabhat, which is Harp of Glory, which um, St. Vladimir's Press actually sells. It's been yeah, translated into that's English. Right? Say that yeah, again. I have that one. You have that one? Yeah, St. Vladimir's Press has that one. Um, he has another one in addition to the Book of Mystery called The Gate of Light. I'll, I'll differentiate the word here is Hohit instead of Ankas because St. Yared or St. Jared the Aksumite also has one called Ankas Abrahan. So they're very similar. They both are, are words that mean door or gate of light. He has another one called the Praise of the Cross. And the primary one I want us to look at together and we'll read again like we were reading earlier is um, it's called the Sa'atat, 
which is the the hours. And actually, yeah, I looked up the Arabic because I was curious, and I found uh-huh. it two different ways. Yeah, I, I found one way of saying "kam uh, al-sa'a" or "kam al-sa'atu al-an" to ask like what time it is, and that so that the, yeah, that's the hour. Like which hour is that right? Yeah, uh, ka- kam sa'a. You said. Yeah, and then yeah. the other what, one, what the other one said "kam al-sa'atu al-an." Uh, what time is it right now? Yeah. 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 So, but I heard the word in there, which is sa'at. Oh. Okay. Yeah, which is yeah. the plural. So sa'at for us, and and I I heard also you you I don't know if it's in your dialect, but watch is also that we use that for watch as well. Yeah. Sa'at. Yeah. yeah, yeah sa'at t- there's watch. there's a t in it, but it's silent for us. Okay, we pronounce the t. But okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so if, we use it for watch. If, if it becomes possessive, we pronounce it. So I'll say. Hi, Sa'a, but if I'm saying Deacon's watch, I would say Sa'at is Shammas. There we go. So it's yeah. that's the word, and yeah. so that's the hours or the yeah. liturgy of hours. And that's, I think, his most impressive work. And so we'll be looking at that later. But he's basically a figure born in the 1300s in um, medieval Ethiopian history. And um, What's interesting about his hagiography called Gadla Bagiorgis is that it has eyewitness accounts, at least alleged eyewitnesses uh, that are accounts that are used in the telling of his story. And um, Deacon Mahari contrasts that with Iyasus Moa, who's another famous scholar of the church, whose hagiography was written 200 years after he died or fell asleep with the Lord. And he, maybe a more egregious case, St. Yared or St. Jared, the Oxomites hagiography is written a thousand years after his falling asleep with the Lord. And wow. so the information we have on Abba Georgis is very close to his time period. And he was um, he was actually the, the interesting thing for modern politics without getting too into it. The hagiography was written by an Abba Yaakob or Jacob of Bizen Monastery, which is in modern day Eritrea. And it's mm. it's deep in the far kind of north or periphery of what was the Ethiopian Empire at the time. There are some who think that area was independent, but the fact that he's writing the hagiography of this Abba or this monk uh, m- a lot south of him and in a different region is uh, interesting as a historical note. Absolutely, great point. Yeah, and um, there's another work called Dersana Urael, which is um, it's a uh, it's a text about the archangel Urael. Do, do you guys pronounce it that way, or I don't know if there's a different way of pronouncing it. Urael. Urael. Yeah. yeah. So there's a work, and and he's mentioned a little bit in in there as well. But um, that monk Abba Yaakob or Jacob of Bizen in modern day Eritrea, he was considered an erudite member of one of the Eustatiaites which in this time period, I'd covered this in one of the podcast episodes on my channel, but there were some people in the 1300s who wanted to, they were Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists before the Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah, I saw something about that, yeah. right. They wanted to honor Saturday uh, as the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. And you see a lot of Sabbath language in St. Yadid, the Aksumites work, but he's always talking about Sunday because we call our word for Saturday, you know, we have a totally unique calendar. Our word for Saturday is Sanvet Karamit, which means the first Sabbath. And then mm-hmm. for Sunday, we have two words. One, Uhud, which means one. And it's related to words like Wahad ah. and Ahadu yes. and things like that. Um, and then the other name for it is Sanvet Christian, which is the Sabbath of Christians. Wow. And so St. Yarej is always talking about the Sabbath of Christians, but sometimes he just says like the word Sabbath. Whereas um, Abba Georgis kind of has this affiliation with these Eustatiaites, especially uh, the author of his, um, the author of his uh, hagiography, uh, modern day Eritrea and a lot of the uh, some of the modern day Tigray region was because it was in the periphery of the empire. It was a place of refuge for a lot of the Eustatiaites, and even Eustatios himself is said to have, I think, finally died in Armenia or somewhere like that to the point of exile over this issue. It was later resolved, um, we'll find, by one of Abba Georgis's students mm. uh, in the royal court who becomes king and basically you know, splits the baby to go against uh, Solomon's mm-hmm. compromise. And he says, let's celebrate the divine liturgy on Saturdays and Sundays. No problem. <laughs> No, no pun intended, since the dynasty was from Solomon. From right? Solomon, exactly. Yeah. Uh, he was, was a king 
Dawood who was against uh, Ambagi Wargis? Was it? He, yeah, there's um, yeah, there's some tension there, but then you know it's his son Emperor Zarayakob who okay. uh, eventually kind of resolves a lot of these issues, and and King Dawood himself got into some issues with um, magic and other things. I oh, think, I if I'm not mistaken, he's also oh. the one that I think got uh, our Egyptian uh, brothers and sisters on edge because at <laughs> one point I think the um, I'm not sure if it was the Mamluks, but one of the the Muslim groups had captured the Pope of Alexandria. And so he pulled up to Upper Egypt. For those who don't know, Upper Egypt is down when you look on a map. South Egypt. Yeah, yeah South yeah. Egypt. And so he pulled up with his troops to Upper Egypt. And he said, release the Pope of Alexandria or I will dry the River Nile and your people will starve to death. And uh, the people, uh, the, the Muslim rulers of Egypt were like, I'm not sure if he can do that, but it sounds like he can. <laughs> and so they ended up uh, releasing the Pope of Alexandria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I think the the Nubians at the time, or uh, they might have been an ally to you guys. I can't remember. Yeah, they go in and out of it in different times. Yeah. I think by this late period in the 1300s, they would have been thoroughly um, Islamized. I oh, I, okay. Because it would have been it would have been uh, maybe 900 years or something earlier where they were still in a kind of a kind of Christian, Christian remnant. remnant. Okay. But yeah, so yeah. he he um. He was born from, and this is kind of an important part of his story that people, um, I think they overlook, but he was, he was born from a noble woman. I think it's very fascinating when you look at something like the Russian emigres from the uh, Russian Revolution that mm. went to France because France was like their peak of civilization and society in their mind. And then a lot of those people came to New York and built St. Vladimir's. You look at all of their backgrounds and you'll kind of be surprised to find out a lot of them were tied to the aristocrats of Russia, which is why they were fleeing the revolution in the first Makes place. Sense. And Makes some sense. of their family may have been even related to like the white party, which were the yeah. monarchists. In, it's like the, 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 sh um, we, we call them Jama'at the Shah, the people of the Shah who came from Iran to California. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I you go to uh <laughs> they call it Tarangulus, right? You go to uh Westwood where my father uh, still works and you see them uh protesting over there and some of them have the flag of the Shah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I'm I'm a chess player too, so people who know and my best friend is Persian, anyone who uh knows chess knows that checkmate is originally Shamat. Mat yeah. being our our word for death. That's an Arabic or Aramaic loan word for them and Shah is king. So the death so of the king we thought they invented it but we i don't know i could be wrong about this but we thought that the word itself was arabic it was sheikh sheikh mat so it, i don't it, know it could be i heard it was shah mat yeah okay. i've heard Maybe it, shah I, and it sheikh are related words i don't know i don't know yeah it might it, it makes sense extending the tribal leader to uh, a higher level i could see that i, I don't know the, those words well enough to yeah. kind of conclude but the point is abba Georgi of sagla he comes from this noble background on his mother's side and on his father's background, there's these interesting kind of um, positions where because Ethiopia ruled itself and, you know, still does, but, you mm -hmm. know, had communist period since the 70s where it, it left the connection of church and state. But because of that, there were royal priests as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have an antagonistic relationship with the state in Ethiopia. And so his father was one of the royal priests or the head uh, royal priest. And his mother was a noble woman. And so he's kind of getting prepared to live that life. And so King Dawood actually tries to get him married off uh, so that he could kind of continue in this line. And there's a, a funny episode where he actually declines the marriage proposal so many times that he thinks he has to do something kind of what you'd consider untoward or immoral, which is he uh, he dons monastic robes to kind of trick the the king into thinking he was a monk. Prior to him actually becoming a monk, he does eventually <laughs> become one. And it raises interesting kind of ethical situations like David taking the showbread, which the Lord mentions yes, as well, right? right? Is, yeah. it, is it good to lie? Is it good to steal? Well, what's the situation? <laughs> And, uh, you know, he grew up like many other people. He went to a place called Debra Haik, which was a monastery where he learned um, reading, which is typically taught through uh, the chanting of the Psalter, first reading it and then chanting it, the singing and chanting of the liturgy, and then biblical and patristic interpretation, a lot of um, the things that you're doing as well. 
there's a recently departed great g scholar, Professor Getacho Haile. Um, Professor Avta Mikhail has given him the Ethiopian title, Lik Lik Awant. Uh, I don't think the church ever officially did, but it's it's nice and appreciative. And he thinks that Abba Georgis is behind some of the anaphoras as well. For those mm. who don't know, that's another way of referring to kind of the second part of our liturgy that is about the Eucharist. We typically have 14, uh, which seems excessive, <laughs> that, we, that we use all the time. And in the manuscript edition, there's something like 20 to 50, depending on which monastery you go. And so Getacho Haile is kind of the authority on the Ge'ez language, and he just passed away about uh, a couple years ago or so. And he believes and attributes se uh, several anaphoras to Abba Georgis of Sagala as well. So just kind of like the massive scope of what he's done is, um, is it's still felt to this day. And then I, I think um, to this day, the thing that is used the most that I'd... Um, like to mention with you and and go over with you is the liturgy of the hours but yeah that's that's kind of a short narrative of his life and again it's from uh, Mahari Zamanak Awerku's forthcoming dissertation I'm sure you hear even his father's name is Zamanak which is of the angel yeah I, I'm I'm very excited for it if it gets published because I think he's turning in the Saint Georgus is turning into a big deal he's already a big deal but he's turning into a big deal mainstream um uh like he people talk about him now like he is the 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 severus or the gregory of tatev of the tewahedo tradition you know and that i think the tewahedo tradition there's a lot to say there because people don't realize this since they're not imperial in the historical sense with the romans they they are the biggest oriental orthodox church is the ethiopian orthodox church is the biggest one so um they represent they are underrepresented if anything you know absolutely yeah um let me pull up for you the this is now a paper from professor hafta mikhail that i said he's a, a catholic eritrean scholar and uh, one of the foremost in um, the field of the liturgy of the is right so this is from the Ethiopica Journal coming out of Hamburg University in German, uh, in Germany. And uh, you can see some of the German there. <laughs> um, and this is Old Testament lessons in the Sa'atat, or the hours, the liturgy of hours of Georgis Saglawi. The Saglawi just means uh, man of Sagla. Yeah. And um, so let's let's jump into it man let's uh, let's uh let's uh read it together and and pause if there's anywhere we want to um pause but there's the intro go ahead and start off and if there's anything you want to pause on and we could talk about or anything that we can clarify all right anyone familiar with the liturgy of the word of the qadase right did i say that yeah right? that's right that's right that's how we say liturgy and with the recitation of the yaradian divine office knows that the Old Testament is not read during these ceremonies. Nevertheless, the Old Testament is read during the hours of the Sa'atat. Sa this article explores to what extent the Orthodox Tewahedo churches have included the Old Testament in the Sa'atat composed by Giwargis Saglawi in the 15th century. In this article, I will analyze how the Old Testament readings became the main element in almost each hour of the Sa'atat, both Giorgi Saglawi and Zara Yaqub, among other fathers, had That's always the king after Dawood. That's the son of Dawood. Hmm. Had always highlighted the importance of the whole Bible in Christian life and in the liturgy. What we see in the Sa'atat, in which a large place is given to the Old Testament readings is the result of the committed activity of these religious leaders to teach the importance of the whole Bible and the church. Okay, I think we could, we can pause there for a sec because I'm curious like what your tradition says as well. I've heard in the past, for example, that um, in the Syriac tradition, there's no book of Revelation. And it's mm -hmm. funny, you know, we're in the same communion, but this is, you know, this is us not being dogmatic about things that we don't need to be. In the Ethiopian church, we on Pesach, on Pascha, we read the entirety of John's revelation. But yeah. typically in the Eucharistic liturgy, we don't have 
Old Testament readings, which is what <laughs> it's saying. Do you guys have Old Testament readings in your? Uh, no, I was gonna ask. Did you do you know if you had it historically? Uh, the, the Revelation or Old Testament? No, readings? Old Testament. I don't know if we had it historically. I haven't seen anything that says that. But basically, it's in the Saatat of Abba Georgis. I so see. beginning from the 1300s. Um, so to give you an example, my friend, he's also, uh, I, you know, I'm biased, so I won't recuse myself. Uh, Deacon Mahadi is the, uh, the godfather of my son. And uh, he grew up at a parish called uh, Mikhail or Michael in the capital city, Addis Ababa Mercato, which is like right in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. And even in the capital city, which you'd think is more secular than like the countryside, he grew up going to church where basically from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., they would pray the Sa'atat or the Liturgy of Hours. And mm -hmm. then at 5 a.m., the Eucharistic Liturgy would begin. So if you're the type of person that goes to church every Sunday and you come in at 2 a.m., you will hear the Old Testament readings. But if you kind of skip the Sa'atat and just come for the Eucharistic liturgy, you wouldn't be hearing the Old Testament readings. Wow. Wow. Okay. So what we, and you know, I always, I always tell people this, the, the canons of the, of the, of the churches, whether it's scripture canons or pastoral canons or whatever canons they are, they are rules binding that community to this particular thing. So then how do we know the diversity of the canon of scripture um, for the Oriental Orthodox is that the lectionary, uh, those books that are being read in the lectionary in the particular churches, in the particular communities. That's how the canons are decided. What have we been reading here in the liturgical services the rites the liturgy of the hours in your case um uh, and the reason i ask historically is because this is second millennium what we're talking about so i would make i would have a hypothesis that this is something that has been going on for you guys somehow even if it's not the way that saint uh georgis did it but maybe there's some other way i don't know so for us for, as far as i know when the liturgy used to be longer, we would have seven readings, uh, seven scripture readings, um, four from the Old Testament, three from the New. And it would be based on this, that year round, with the climax being Pascha, right, um, that we would know what books constitute the canon, or else how else would we know? So... Uh, Right now, you guys read from the New Testament, but how many readings do you have in the liturgy from the New Testament? Yeah, and I want to correct myself because when you started saying that, it came back to me. Mm. So um, we actually have one Old Testament reading, um, but it's always short. It's always two or three lines, and mm. it's from the Psalms of David. So okay. the first reading is done by the... Um, I might mess the order up off the top of my head, but it should be done by the first deacon. And that will be the Pauline epistle. Okay. The second reading should be done by the associate deacon. And that's the Catholic or universal epistle, the epistles like John, James, Peter, mm. and includes Revelation um, right. on Sundays. Um, the third reading would be the Acts of the Apostles. And that would be by the associate priest. Typically, I I've noticed um, other Oriental churches like the Copts, for example, could have just one priest. Um, canonically, you're supposed to have at least two priests for us and three deacons. Uh, two of those deacons would be doing the readings. One uh, would carry an umbrella or something like that. I do see Daniel Ibrahim said that they, uh, they have the same tradition as us in the Coptics, uh, tradition of reading Revelation or the Apocalypse on the night of the Feast of the Resurrection. So I'm at um, three so far. Um, after the associate priest reads the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the deacon leads the entire, the, the first deacon comes back again and leads the entire congregation in the chanting of the Psalms. All these other readings are just readings, but the Psalm is actually chanted. And mm -hmm. that is supposed to open up the gospel that the number one priest reads. So that's five readings technically, but the, the one of those five readings, the Psalm is, uh, is chanted rather than just read in a, a normal reading voice. So for us, uh, Nowadays, uh, depending on what um, 
which archdiocese you're in or which parish you're in, it varies from two to three readings. So it could be well, our our um I was saying this on another thing too. The the categories, the categories of scripture are different for us. So we have like for example, um Acts of the Apostles would count as one of the apostolic writings. The apostolic writings being Acts, uh, James, Peter, and John. John being the epistle. We don't say first John because we don't have second and third. So it's just John. Wow, epistle. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And also the epistle of Peter because we don't have second. So it's not first. So it would be um, Acts, James, Peter, and John. That's an apostolic section. So that would be read first. And then one of the Pauline epistles, including Hebrews, one of them. And any deacon can read either one of those. Um, and then for the gospel, it has to be the celebrant of the liturgy. Who reads the God. That is chanted. The others are just read. Um, after the gospel, there's usually a hymn. Depending on what day of the week it is, it could be Saint Ephraim or something like that. But um, and there are implications, are very strong implications that we say that make Ephraim's hymns equal with David's in the Psalms. Wow. So, yeah, uh, That's so, yeah, yeah. So, um, but this is kind of like the liturgy right now. Now that we don't do, we don't do the Old Testament ones in the liturgy anymore, mm -hmm. I know right now there's a restoration movement uh, by the Synod. There's a YouTube series on it by His Eminence uh, Mor Severius Roger Akras, but it's in Arabic. For uh, the Synod is working on restoring the liturgy. That's beautiful. And do you have this uh, concept that Professor Abdul Mikhail is talking about, where I think it it often comes from being in the diaspora in America. I want to say I don't hear it as much in Ethiopia, but this idea of looking at like the Old Testament as unnecessary and the New Testament as the only thing. Um, he's saying basically we combat that by the combination of the liturgy hours and the Eucharistic liturgy because you get all the readings together and they're treated as equal. Yeah, I, I see. I see a different layer. Like I see. Uh, diverse lay reactions towards the Old Testament. Some reactions are more like fearful. They kind of, they're scared of it. They don't want to touch it. Some of them are like, yeah, it doesn't apply to us anymore. But usually these are just lay opinions. They're not anything really like, I don't see this like a push from the actual church. It's just kind of the, the people, you know. That's good. I'll, I'll yeah. share my screen again and, and pull it back up. So, this analysis will focus on the Sa'atat of Georgis currently in use, disregarding other known types of Sa'atat, since they are unlikely to be currently in use and their existence is known only through manuscripts. Um, it is no secret that the Sa'atat of Georgis at first met with adversity in many monasteries and churches and that many clergy refused to accept it. As a result, many monasteries started to compose their own Sa'atat reflecting their own spirituality, their monastic tradition, and theological views. I want to pause here and say that Mahari and I, for example, have found such a sa'atat that is not his and that is someone else's, and we've never yes. heard of it being used anywhere. And um, we have kind of transcribed it from the manuscript. We even found a g'uz or Ethiopic diatessaron in it that we've been shopping around and trying to find the right way to edit. And Is it Tatians? Um, it's not, it's unique. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. He's compared it, I think, to the Arabic translations that exist. And there are some things that are similar, but it's different. And ours is about 30 pages or so. And it's PDF, like with very minimal commentary, we just kind of mm. are trying to present it to people. But like the point here is that, as you said, these kind of local traditions and local canons they're they're not as strict as dogma and so because of that you have different versions and you'll see throughout the story of abba Georgis, like that i was reading earlier his connection to the royal court and him eventually becoming a royal priest himself got him into a position of power where he was able to kind of uh, standardize the saatat and mm -hmm. particularly like his flavor um 
and and you could call that you know providence or historical accident or whatever but there are multiple copies of the Sa'atat. There's even an Alexandrian one uh, that is available that some people like um, Father or Asis um, Bratu Kiros, who has also got his uh, doctorate in theology as well, has, has done some scholarship on. And so there are other liturgy of ours out there and available, but there's also one that's kind of currently in use. It goes on to say, having examined a number of the manuscripts containing the Sa'atat attributed to Georgi Saglawi, we can point out two types, the major and the minor. This one's going to blow people's mind. The major Sa'atat, so-called because they give the full structure of each hour of the day, 24-hour recitation. So this is the idea that he provided prayers so that if you wanted to, at a monastery, obviously you can't do this with just human beings all the time, like, the same ones but it's a funny thing that we talk about sometimes in the clergy is like in ethiopia sometimes you have some monasteries where there are shifts and and people are it's like to maximize the prayers of the day especially during um i had a, a deacon mihrat malak who is it's funny he's a student of neuroscience at harvard right now but he's totally into the digwa which is the Euridian or the juridian tradition and mm. so we have two different sets of hymns and the juridian one is typically filled with instruments. The Sa'atat of Abba Georgis, it's uh, good to point out, is always without instruments. Mm -hmm. But the even the Juridian one during the Som, during the, the Great Fast, stops using instruments. And so in some places they will clap, in some places they won't even clap. It depends on what they're they're going to do. Wow. Um, but they basically, they don't use the kabaro or the drum, and they don't use the Tzlanatzal, which is the shaker or the, the sistrum during this time period to try to make it more solemn and I the idea see. is if you have shifts of people you can get people going up to 24 hours a day praying whether it's from the dugwa of saint yared or the saatat of abba georgis and so you have these mustabwat which are intercessions old and new testament lessons psalms old and new testament canticles which are songs various hymns we have our word uh mazmurat similar to the hebrew mizmor and uh it just means psalm or spiritual song and responses and you have this alota kidan which is the prayer of the covenant or the prayer of the testament the prayer of uh blessing and so on and so forth then you have the one that's more common that i spoke about that's not 24 hours that's the minor saatat mm. and that one is pretty much 2 a.m to 5 a.m um for those who who do that and there are some people who do it every sunday there are some people who only do it during um the fast of the translation or ascension of our lady which is the 16 day fast in in august um, let me ask you this so for us um the first prayer of the day is ramsha ramsha like the the sunset is the first prayer of the day of the the daily prayers that's when the new day starts for in your tradition also the new day starts at sunset um sunset so 6 p.m you're saying like right now i think sunset is at seven nowadays oh, okay um, so like some and then in the in the winter it's like around four or five i don't know it depends yeah. on the season it's yeah. um it's difficult to say and I, I won't say i'm an expert at like when these things begin yeah. what i can say is um typically major holidays will start at 8 or 9 p.m the day before a feast and they'll continue till about 10 a.m. or 11 the next day. Got so it. those are like normal major holidays. Um, bigger things like uh, Easter are like that too, except they'll start maybe earlier, 6 p.m. Others will start still 9 p.m. Okay. Um, so really prayer are... every day is 5 a.m., but if that's the Eucharistic liturgy and other prayers that are associated with it, if you're doing the full uh, minor, the full minor, I should say, because almost nobody does the 24 hours. That's mostly mostly a manuscript thing. Yeah. But if you're <laughs> if you're if, if you're doing like the full version of the minor, because people even have a minor version of the minor, which is yeah. like two hours instead of four hours. Yeah. It'd be like two a.m. to five a.m. or two a.m. to six a.m. There are some people who just do like a one hour version, which is like a minor minor version. So, if um. It, like I guess then there is a conformity to modern understandings of time because obviously before they didn't have like five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. 
right? Well, that, that, well that even, it. yeah, even today we speak like the Bible. Okay. So third hour. Uh, fourth, exactly. Nine. Exactly. Okay. So people, um, my cousin was recently leading a Bible study and he was teaching them acts and you hear the prayer, of, uh, the preaching of Peter and it's at the third hour and they're like, we're not drunk. It's only the third hour. And people are like, what is the third hour? Immediately an Amharic speaker recognizes, uh, we say, um, Sost Sa'at or Salastu Sa'at, which means the third hour, it's, it's 9 a.m. We mm -hmm. know that. And the kind of easy trick, I don't know if this is the normal thing that I do, is like if you have an analog clock in front of you, just look at what's the opposite. So on the opposite side of three is nine, and you know like what that is. Yeah. So for us, like 6 a.m. is uh, it's the zero hour, and we run through 12 hours twice. So in a sense, it's kind of like military. Well, sunrise. Training. Yeah, so sunrise mm -hmm. is, we call it, the 12th hour but uh sunset is also the 12th hour so mm -hmm. we have two sets of 12 that yeah. repeats and the way you differentiate is you say like are you talking about the 12th hour in the morning or the 12th hour in the afternoon or the evening and that's how you differentiate from 6 a.m versus 6 p.m yeah but that's how they talk yeah nina's saying that's what we do oh, yeah. okay you guys do that too okay yeah yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, so yeah, let me present it again. Mm -hmm. So that's the major and the, um, the minor orders. Uh, go ahead and start reading this one. Our study cannot be based solely on the printed books of the Sa'atat that the Orthodox Tawahiro churches use for liturgical celebrations. These are rather arbitrarily abbreviated. So unfortunately, they can be of no great help in our study. In contrast, the following manuscripts are of paramount importance. They are the basis of my research. So that's what you and I just discussed, right? Mm -hmm. Is that people just like, they make the minor version, they make a minor of the minor version. So now mm -hmm. he's shouting out like EMML, which is like the manuscripts that you find at St. Mm -hmm. John's University. They have Syriac manuscripts too. I don't know if you're familiar with them in I'm Minnesota. Not. That's awesome. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a fantastic, they actually retweeted my uh, podcast because we had Mahadi on my show when Kita Chohaile fell asleep with the Lord and we did a whole podcast episode commemorating him and all of his contributions to the G's corpus. But yeah, th th that's not as relevant information. These are just like the specific ones. If you search EMML, you'll find St. John's in Minnesota. They have a ton of Syriac and probably even Armenian and definitely Arabic and G's manuscripts over there in Minnesota. So keep reading from here. Okay. Two complete at incomplete attempts were made to photograph manuscript yeah an important and ancient manuscript of the monastery uh identified Gassachan, by the yeah. that's another name for Sagla for his town oh okay identified by the monks as the personal work of Georgis the first attempt was made in 1993 by a team of French scholars during their field work in the monastery of Gasacha the team was led by Bertrand Hirsch together with Marie Laure Deret and Harvey Penick they managed to photograph only a few folia of the codex, but identified its title. Uh, must have yeah, that's just like the book of uh, ours. We can fast forward a bit. This is just kind of the, the so do you way. does this, um, does this change like uh, during the Lent right now? Mm -hmm. The the sa'atat is something you guys do year round, yeah, correct. Okay, does does anything shift the the prayers or anything are different during the the lamp the the psalm? Yeah, so now we can we can get a little uh spicy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to those asking for a link, I'll send uh, this stuff to um Subdeacon Dan and he'll share it with you all. So a p part of the tradition as it exists frustrates me, um but it's funny and there is some diversity of practice. So the um, monasteries differ, but for example, my uh, maternal grandfather is buried at Waldba, which is a fourth or fifth century monastery in the Amhara region that borders the Tigray region, mm -hmm. and is a very ancient monastery that is known to kind of not really use the digwa of Saint Yarit. They still have the melodies in the in the Eucharistic liturgy, but they view even instruments themselves as worldly. And it's funny, like this is even within the same is right. Mm -hmm. And so they exclusively do the Eucharistic liturgy and the Sa'atat of Abba Georgis. 
And the reason they do that is because year round, they, they never use instruments. And so that's like asceticism all the time, even from holy instruments. Yeah. Um, a normal parish, if they have a choir master who's knowledgeable in the hymns of, of Yared, would use instruments throughout the year and then would stop during the time of um, the great fast. And then it really depends if they if they want to, they'll do um, just uh, the 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 Sa'at Atav Abba Georgis. If they want to, they'll do just the hymns of St. Yared. And then this is the one that I don't like. If they want to, they'll split the parish. And the, if this is when they have like 100, some, some parishes have like 300 clergy. And so they'll put uh, in like giant cathedrals, they'll put some chanters on the right and some chanters on the left. And the ones like on the left are doing the Sa'at Atav Abba Georgis. And the ones on the right are doing the hymns of Yared. And it's mm -hmm. like, they're doing it all and the idea is to say like we've left nothing behind we've said it all why i, I personally don't like it is because like you're not like doing the same prayer now you're doing different prayers and i like it's that all too. beautiful oh yeah so look for us it's the same what you're saying you know during the lent it's it's because every day we have different prayers but during the lent we have different prayers different than the other the rest of the year and for ba'utha the nineveh fast also, we have different prayers during that. So for per the season, the prayers are particular. You know, uh, that's what the Oriental Orthodox churches, bro. The the tradition is so rich. Like I I don't know if you guys have this too. We have something called the Beit Gazo, which is the the tunes, like the the hymn, the 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 way you do the melody uh, for the week for the day. So we have eight eight keys, eight scales. Um, the first one would be um, the the what is it called? The opening of the church. Um, I forgot the name in English. The consecration of the church. I think it is. Yeah. That so that, right. yeah, that would be the first scale, the first tune. So for that week, you start with uh, scale number one, and they're paired because there's eight. So they're paired. One always goes with five. So you do Sunday in one. And then once you get to sunset, sunset becomes Monday now. Now you do you start doing the prayers in the fifth tune till you get to sunset again. Then you go back to one. You keep doing the whole week like that. You get to Saturday evening, it switches, two and six now for the week after. You go the whole week that way. So then it keeps going, two, six, three, seven, four, eight. Then it flips. Now it's five, one. And then um, six, two, seven, three, eight, four. It switches and then it switches back again. So we do the whole year like this. So imagine with all the prayers we have, the anaphoras, the different rites, uh, the, the tunes to learn. Like this is truly a primitive apostolic Christianity, raw. Like no conformity. We're not getting rid of our stuff. Everybody has whatever they had. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nobody's telling anybody, hey, you guys got to drop this. We all have to go be this way or something so yeah, and, and it's funny because some people see that um that uniformity and conformity and say oh that's the sign of universalism whereas other people say uh <laughs> like what's on the dollar e pluribus unum <laughs> out of many one they see the many rights and they're like well that's the actual witness to the mm -hmm. universality right there absolutely that's ca that's the catholic church yes yeah, uh, I don't. I can't say about the specific meters. I'm I'm less um, trained in the in the musical chants. I know that we have them, and we have specific musical notations too, that which like predate Beethoven and Mozart and all that. I also know this: the early Syriac melodies had an influence. I have heard even on Gregorian chant itself in Latin and in the West. And so, I'm sure with the uh, arrival, of course, of the first metropolitan of Ethiopia, St. Frumentius mm -hmm. from Tyre, which is in modern day uh, Lebanon, yeah. and then the coming of the nine Greco-Syrian saints as well. I say Greco only because they're coming from the eastern part of the Roman Empire, and it's not clear exactly where they come from. Um, but like, and there's a lot of Greek language that enters the Giz language at that time. And we, we already had uh, uh, Greek and Giz on our coins, so we were kind of bilingual. Um, I, I don't know exactly what the influence is there, but it's it's very likely that 
that the school of Ephraim and Jacob of Saruk had an impact on early Aksum. With time, of course, we elaborated and made something totally unique. Mm. Yeah, Beit Gazo. I don't know what Gazo means, but Beit is our word treasure. too. Treasure. How do you say treasure in Amhar? We say Mazgab. Okay. You see here that the root is the same. Yeah. Yeah. The Gaza. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, in, in Tigrinya, Gaza is, um, it's like their domicile, their house. And mm -hmm. in Amharic, it means to purchase or to make it under your own. And rulers, rulers have that that too. So maybe there is something tied to treasure there. Yeah, yeah. But bait is bait. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and your name, even Daniel, how it means only God can judge. <clears throat> My grandfather's uh, name, who's buried at that monastery uh, that I was telling you about, is Danyo. It's the same uh, root. He it means judge, judge it or them or the situation. Do you guys name Daniel? Yeah, we do. do. Yeah, I have, okay. I have a good cousin named da uh, we say Daniel, but yeah, yeah. Dane we, it's a it's a common name. I love that. That's amazing. That's awesome. Well yeah. Um let me <clears throat> present it again. Yeah. And let's um go here. Start reading from here, the biblical readings. The biblical readings of the liturgy of the word in the Qadase and in the liturgy of the hours, Mahlat of the Daga'a. Is that yeah, right? It's a digwa. Digwa. Okay. Yeah, they do that digwa. weird upside down E for the uh, sound. That's okay. I wasn't sure what uh, the W yeah. part. Yeah. Digwa, as attested by the Mushafa Gasawi. Gasawi. That's our lectionary. Yeah. Okay. And and as handed down by the Orthodox Tewahedo churches, are made up of four New Testament readings only. Those are the ones I mentioned earlier. Hmm. There is no doubt that this follows the coptic system of the liturgy of the word okay so this is where i think um over maybe the second millennium somewhere you would know better the um the habasha rite conformed to alexandria a little bit yes right beginning yeah. um so yeah our first metropolitan fermentius who's later Abba Salama, very clear to our Syriac speakers what that means, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Abba Salama was uh, ordained by St. Athanasius of Alexandria, St. Athanasius right. the Great against the world. Yeah. And um, the the history from then to about the year 1000 or so is, is kind of murky, but it's very clear in writing from 1270 until the 19, uh, mid-1900s that we had all Coptic overseers or metropolitans and so that's that's the period where that would happen and interestingly enough there was some weird exchange where they also received the full canonization of saint takala haimanot and so you see a lot of like takala haimanot um who's a saint from shoah which is in the amhara region uh mm. saint takala haimanot uh websites and icons and um story of that saint in the coptic tradition where you don't you don't necessarily like have all the other saints like they have moses the ethiopian he has other names too but mm -hmm. we don't have moses the ethiopian and then we have a saint called uh, the slave mm -hmm. of the holy spirit mm -hmm. and we say he's egyptian the egyptians have never heard of him uh <laughs> but, but, but they have takla who you guys have the, the nine assyrian saints right is it nine uh nine syrian they're not assyrians okay we have um our book of monks which mm. are written by the Assyrian Church of the East, the, mm -hmm. the three authors, um, John Saba, the spiritual elder, uh, Isaac, the Syrian, and there's some dispute and needs to be more scholarship about the third one, but likely a Church of the East scholar as well. Okay. And then the Syrian saints that you have. Yes. Uh, is it Syrian in the Hellenic sense Syrian, or is it Syrian in the Mesopotamian understanding? It, it seems to be... Um, the the history that people say greco syrian but that's just because they're okay. coming from the eastern part of the roman empire Got in it. my opinion if they were the true room then mm -hmm. they would have like had us in communion with constantinople but the whole point was that they were fleeing persecution for their christology so i yeah. think it had to have been the mesopotamian type and what's what's the you, you guys have an idea of what century they came yeah it, it would have um it would have been around the time the just before Yared. So Yared is supposed to be 
the seventh century, so the six hundreds. Yeah. So they should be four hundreds so, or five hundreds. This is the ironic part, and this is why I hesitate to say that they're Mesopotamian right away. Mm -hmm. It's because at the time, um, it wasn't it wasn't ethnic like that. It was purely theological. So you'd have Severus, for example, Saint Severus and Saint Peter the Fuller were Greek. Mm -hmm. They weren't Syriac, and um, and Ephraim of Amid, who was the the rival patriot, the Rome rival patriarch, he was Syriac. Wow. So you would have the opposite ethnic groups of today on both sides because it was purely theological. Yeah. With Justinian's persecutions that you're talking about, it forced then the area under direct control of the Romans, which is the Hellenic part, to become purely Chalcedonian. And then those who lived in the margins, you know, in the border areas, you know, rural Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. they were allowed to stay, whatever, because they couldn't that get them. Sense. So then just organically, they yeah. just... Became so they could be Hellenistic Syrians, but who held our Miaphysite Christology. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's not a ton, again, of information about them. Um, there's one called Garima, which Saint Yared even sings about, and so he he's getting like canonized fairly recently for the time within the church that he's in. Um, so that's you know a good sign for him. Um, but yeah, there's not a ton of literature. There needs to be more about them. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, keep going. The second part. The ladder right here. The ladder. Oh, in... Sorry. So, yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. The ladder, in fact, retaining the. Oh, no, no, sorry. It was the second part. You're right. The second part of the biblical readings of the Sa'atat follows the structure of the Mus'hafa Gesawe. The, the latter, in fact, retaining um, the traditional structure of four New Testament readings gives, one, a reading from the Pauline epistles, two, the readings from the Catholic epistles, James, Peter, John, and Jude, also called Hawaria, Apostle. Oh, yeah, like how, is loan word to the Quran like too. Hayawariyin, hey, yeah, mm -hmm. the Quran. And do you know if the get is there, it's implying something about whiteness? No, nothing about whiteness. Um, about being that, friends, to my knowledge, it okay. it comes from the root hora, which means to go. So it's like oh. going ones, ones who go, ones who are. Wow. Safe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, a reading from the Acts of the Apostles and for the Gospel. The structure of the four New Testament readings of the Mus'hafa Gesawe is much older than what is found in the Sa'atat and then what is taught by the Liqawint doctors, teachers, in the traditional commentary school where the Old Testament is also taught. In the period of the composition of the Sa'atat, possibly even before that, it appears that there was a particular predilection for the Old Testament, not only in religious teaching, but also in some religious services and in gatherings of the faithful. In fact, from that time on, the tradition of reading solely from the New Testament in the Eucharistic Liturgy of the Word and in the Maharat ended. In almost every hour of the major Sa'atat, one finds readings from the New Testament as well as one or more readings taken from the Old Testament. Needless to say, the majority of the Old and New Testament readings are always strictly related to the two Sabbaths and to the particular hour in which the Sa'atat is celebrated. In fact, it is safe to say that the guiding principle for the selection of the readings from the Old and New Testaments, the use of Psalms in the Sa'atat, Zama, Zamalat. Yeah, this is the morning. Okay. And Sa'atat Zalilat. That's like La Ila, the evening. Uh, okay, got it. Is the principle of balance. The readings for the hours of Saturday and Sunday, for example, are chosen chosen thematically with particular use of biblical texts that mention what has been accomplished in those two days. Okay, so... Uh, kind of similar, yeah, to what we were saying. Yeah, so then uh, that is... That actually proves that Old Testament readings were being done liturgically uh, previously, right? Yes. To the Sa'atat. That was, yeah, that, yeah. I'm not surprised at all because I, as far as like what we think about you guys, is that the Old Testament is very important to you. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, like Enoch and Jubilees and all that exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, and and our, some of our earliest books, you know, we have these illustrated uh, Gospels, the Garima Gospels, which are at the monastery of one of the nine saints, Garima, who I mentioned earlier. Um, they're considered one of the oldest. People argue about when exactly their age is between the 400s and the 600s. Maybe they'll push it to the 700s, but potentially in that in that range, they're really old il um, illustrated Gospels, illuminated Gospels. And along with them, kind of the oldest books we have are like Psalters and then the Book of Job. Okay. Okay. okay so I'll, I'll read this one. Misbach, yeah. the announcement of the gospel. So that's what I was saying. Whenever the gospel is read, we kind of, we consider it being opened up by the Psalms. We, we consider the Psalms and the book of Isaiah to kind of be like the New Testament within the Old Testament. Um, during any liturgical celebration, the gospel reading is immediately preceded by a psalm versicle called Kudma Wangel Misbach, the announcement or proclamation uh, before the reading of the gospel, or simply Misbach from the verb Sabaka, which means to proclaim or to preach, to announce. Let me digress here to say a few words about the Misbach, an important element of the liturgy of the word. The, this is the chanted psalm that I mentioned earlier. The Misbach has always been an integral part of the liturgy of the word, for the, of the Qaddasayn, of the liturgy of the hours, or Mahalit. The psalm versicle is sung alternatively by the deacon, repeating it twice, and by the people repeating it three times, so that in total that's it's said five times, the same two to three verses. The misbach has never lost its importance in the liturgy of the word and is also called mazmur or psalm to indicate its origins in the book of Psalms. Thus, it is not surprising that the small but interesting gazawe or lectionary uh, from Gundagunde uh, Monastery ascertains, excuse me, ascertains that the unique source of the misbach is the book of Psalms, preferring to use the term mazmur zakurban or the mazmur of the communion. We use the word kurban. I think you guys use kurbana as well. Um, and mazmur and mazmur oh wonderful wonderful then <laughs> so mazmur mazmur is a kurban is clear yeah. <laughs> uh the the psalm of the communion yeah um rather than the usual term for misbach or karma wangil or before the gospel the misbach can never be replaced by songs and hymns nor may it be omitted if the gospel is read, it must be preceded by the misbach. The reading of the psalm is intended as a pointer to the mystery celebrated, as a fitting meditation on the word of God of the day, and as an inspiration for the homily. Teachers are often obsessively concerned about how the deacon should sing the misbach during the liturgical services. Recently, Abbat Umar Lassan Kidana Mariam, a teacher of the Zima, or the, the melodies, at the most important monastery of Debra Abbai in uh, modern-day Tigray, on the east side, it's a... Uh, actually an extension school of the, of the Waldaba Monastery I mentioned earlier, republished the lectionary. In the foreword of the book, to the book, the teacher accepts that the lectionary he has edited does not bear the stamp of originality. It is simply a reprint, combining the editions of 1945 and 1977 in the Ethiopian calendar. Uh, has the Western calendar dates there. They're off by like seven years. He emphasizes the fact that the only originality of this new lectionary is that he himself provided the musical notation for each misbach, for each psalm. And uh, by the way, everyone, there's one for every Sunday, but there's also one for every day of the year. And in fact, there are two for every day of the year because there's a morning and an evening one. So that's uh, two times 365 psalms. Well, sounds what I would, like what I was saying. Yeah, it's the yeah. same. And that's what he does. See, so he personally, this monk, was so obsessed about the musical notations that he himself edited and revised the musical notations of two times 365. So whatever, 700 something uh, wow. Psalms, uh, Psalm verses. Obviously there are only 150, 151 Psalms. Each misbach should be performed according to the pleasant music of Dabrabai. That's a quote, the famous center of traditional education, the Mazgabak Adasebet. Uh, that's the word treasure we have, the treasure of the house of liturgy. In, uh, in doing so, not only is the uniformity of the melody of the misbach retained, so it's that's funny the you even I call say. it the same name. It's just yeah. <laughs> so exactly. the, the bit gazo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I didn't even catch that. <laughs> and, and in doing so, so there was all this diversity. They're trying to standardize and uniform, at least within Ethiopia. Uh, there's uniformity of the melody of the misbach retained and assured within the whole church, but also the singer has no need to struggle to perform the misbach correctly, nor is he tempted to invent his own melody, which is frowned upon. The misbach does not and cannot offer, unless you're a random saint, uh, clear information about the Old Testament readings in the Eucharist or in the divine office of the hours. The term misbach, which as we saw above, can mean announcement, proclamation, also indicates an elevated place where the lectern, which is atronis, it kind of sounds like it's a Greek word, is kept as the Mus'afa Burhan or the Book of Light. 
of Zarah tells us, readings from the Holy Scripture are proclaimed from this elevated place. In the church on an elevated pulpit, the readers should read the Holy Scriptures, taking them from the Octatooks, from the books of all the prophets, and from the history of all the apostles. After this, they should read from the Gospel, because this represents the fulfillment of the Scriptures. So there you go. The, that, that's from the Emperor's book uh, from the 1400s there that re-emphasizes your point, uh, Subdeacon Daniel, and that's that the Old Testament readings were there historically. And it, it's telling you, it's prescribing how to do so. Yeah, bro, this is amazing. You know what's crazy? Earlier today, um, I was on another channel uh, where an Eastern Orthodox asked me, um, like, what what's the evidence, essentially, that the Oriental Orthodox were in communion with each other? You know? And it's like, okay, obviously we were in communion and there's a lot of historical proof for that. But even us, like, you know, historically, maybe you could say um, the jurisdiction of Ethiopia was under the the Patriarchate of Alexandria, right, uh, before. So maybe we don't have direct communication with Ethiopia, but we do through Alexandria kind of thing or something like that. Even without talking to you guys, <laughs> even without talking to you guys, I'm reading about you guys. It's the same as us, like even the same words of things that we have. Like you call it the house of treasure about your the way you do the, the music. That's how that's how what we call ours. We call it the same name. It's um, it's like, you know, they always say, oh, we haven't talked for this long. And now we talk to each other. Literally, we haven't talked and we're seeing that we believe the same thing exactly. But we were in communion of 100% we were through Alexandria. I don't know if you guys commemorate other patriarchs in your liturgy or not. Besides, I, your I've, um, I've never seen it, but obviously it must have been done when our patriarch was in Alexandria. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, and then... Uh, that is my favorite part of the Coptic liturgy. When he yeah. says, <laughs> and his partner in the liturgy, and they shout out the Syriac patriarch. I love that. Yeah, we say, we, every Sunday, we say ours and theirs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is historical. We've been doing this forever. Um, it just, it's really, um, it makes me happy to see that when, what, we, what we just read, uh, because it shows kind of like the richness, the beauty of, the Tawahido right um, natively, primitively, like from itself, you know? And it's something that is so understandable to us too. It's like very, we know what that is. Like if you bring any, any like Western Christian or whatever, they're reading this, it's another language to them. Not like, not literally it is, yeah. but also it, like figuratively too. They don't know what, what that, what's a bit Gaza? What's a treasure house of hymns? What are you guys talking about? You know, um, and then the Old Testament readings previously. It's awesome. It's very yeah, it, re it really is a yeah. case of long lust cousins. And it's it's almost <laughs> like these experiments that scientists do where they separate twins at birth and they're trying to find out, is it nature or is it nurture? And they keep finding that nature ends up being like 50 to 80 percent of things going on, because even when they separate twins, they find them behaving the same way. And so our nature is that of the Ruh Qaddus, of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so when, even when you see us separated for centuries, if not millennia, we still end up doing the same thing in West Asia and in East Africa. And yeah. that's a beautiful thing. And when you say, uh, I think you could you could say manifest, right? Manifest, yeah. Manifest for us, nefes means like breath. So we have all of those. Um, okay. So manifest is spirit. Mm. Breath is istinfas. Okay. Soul is nefs, and wow. then wind is, is nefas. Okay. What about do you have ruh or you don't have? We don't have ruh. Okay. Okay. We don't. But it's not for us, either. soul, wind, breath, and spirit are from yeah. the same, that NFS root. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. And you Great. see, by the way, I pointed out for English speakers, if uh, we're good diving too much in the Semitic languages for you, yeah. <laughs> you see even from the Latin spirit and respiratory system. I know some Habashas who are like respiratory nurses. The respiratory system, you see the word spirit is in there. And so you see this kind of ancient uh, connection if there, yeah. if you look at it. You don't see that with the other word for spirit in English, which comes from German, which is ghost. 
Right. Right? That's why some people say Holy Ghost versus Holy Spirit. The, right. the ghost is from the German. The spirit is from the Latin. Yeah. But, it, but, the, but the Latin has that spirit respiratory system connection. It's funny. Um, I notice when Syriacs and Habesha get together, they always kind of go on these language tangents because <laughs> we're so like happy and shocked yeah. how similar it is. And then so it's like we have to kind of do stuff with other people to keep ourselves honest because otherwise it's like we're having too much fun with our Habesha cousins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, so it's as if we're in a, a house of treasure, a baby yeah. treasure. <laughs> <laughs> this is our candy shop Absolutely. Um, how about we have you do one more one more section let's go over yeah. and then i think yeah. uh, we we did a, a good amount for everyone and i'll send you the materials and you can share it with them wherever and sure. i'll share it with people on on my stuff as well we'll have you um take us home with this last section i think it goes another uh, maybe two pages and a half or so so go right. ahead old testament readings during lent before describing the readings of the Old Testament and the celebration of the Sa'atat, a brief excursion into Old Testament readings during the celebration of the Eridian liturgy of the hours in Lent is not out of place. Somewhat unexpectedly in Lent, both the Soma Degwa hymnary for Lent and the Me'raf Zasom. Me'raf the psalm, okay, ordinary for Lent, give instructions on readings from the Old Testament, especially from the prophets, without, however, giving the exact biblical passages. Similarly, Manuscript Vatican City, Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana, 20th century, a manuscript containing the Ma'rafat, gives instructions not only on readings from the Old Testament, but also indicates when and what to read during the time of Lent. There is a clear directive that during the first half of Lent from the beginning until Dabrazeit. That's the mountain of olives for us. Yeah. Z Zaytun, we say. Dabra. Mm -hmm. Same word. <laughs> yeah. Dabra, Dabra for us means way. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting. So in, uh, in Hebrew, uh, Dabar and dabarim and all that it's the word so you hear dabar yahweh or dabar adodai is the word of the lord but mm. there is an understanding it is a word it's not a random word it's a word which is addressing a public matter which is a judgment rendered by a senior to a junior in a public place which would typically okay. be like on a mountain or something that's why you see a lot of biblical images there and so um my uh, hebrew teacher is father paul nadim tarazi he's a palestinian um, who was born before the state of Israel. <laughs> That's a mm. different story from Jaffa. Uh, many, many, many years ago, he's in his 80s right now. And uh, he taught me that there might be sometimes some aspect of a word preserved in one language, but it's highlighted in another. Another example he gives, not to go too much in a tangent, for example, is you have uh, in our language, gavr or gavor is um, slave. Or bond servant in Hebrew, it means strong man, and so he suggested to me there might be a proto Semitic meaning that, like, the strongest of the slaves is the GBR or the Jabir or the Gabir, hey, or, hey, yeah. Jabbar. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, and, um, in another, uh, on this word, exactly, DBR, um, DBR for us means just mountain. I so see. it's possible the Hebrew retains the idea of the word of judgment spoken from the mountain, but for the Giz, it's just mountain. I see. Over time, because we kept building our churches in these caves in the mountains, Debr also came to mean church. So in some contexts, the Debr means your church. I see. Um, so we say it, but originally it means mountain. So in this context, it means Mount, Mount Olivet or the Mountain of Olives or of Zaytun or of Zayt. I think you find it in the Akkadian too. It could mean, I think, wilderness. Wilderness, yes. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, yeah, in the Hebrew, it's midbar. Midbar is wilderness, but it's, yeah, it's a related root. So yeah. dabar and midbar. Dabar is word in Hebrew, and midbar is wilderness. And we use that transliterated sometimes in Giz too. So it, get, it gets confusing when you have, you have words that are like naturally related to each other, and then you add the loan words. Yeah. The book of Isaiah is to be read. In the second part of Lent, from Debra Zayt until, but not including, 
Uh, oh, sorry. Was... I should mention that's the that's the fifth week for us. Uh, we have eight weeks of the fast, and so the beginning, the Sunday, the first Sunday of the fifth week is is begins the week which is called the Mount of Olivet, and so oh. the entire Gospel of Matthew chapter twenty four is read during that time. Yeah, um, I think it should be it should be eight weeks. I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, uh, not including what do you say, Hoshana? You call uh, it that? We we treat it as an S, but it's actually spelled with the sheen, with okay. the S H. It, it, it's a very funny thing that we've lost the sheen's S H ability, mm. and uh, so we have two S's, like the Samek and the sheen, but we pronounce both as S. Um, and what do you do with the sad? Um, we say it like S. Uh, okay, like Som. Yeah, som. We say okay. som, som, Got som, it. and salot like salat. We say salot for prayer, and som for fast. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. But 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 the real scholars know that it should be certain words that have the sheen. Yeah. It be uh, we call it nugususa. How uh, many letters do you guys have? Um, <laughs> you can count strict, them. Strictly about thirty three, but each one oh, wow. has seven. So so in Arabic and in other uh, Semitic languages, you guys come up with like vowel dot. Uh, mm -hmm. things right yeah to, to get the vowels otherwise yeah. you know all original semitic languages are just consonantal uh, right. with the exception of things like the ayn and the alif which are like the natural vowels within the consonantal uh language so uh saint frumentius in the 300s uh a.d is attributed with adding seven vowel variations for each of mm -hmm. our 33 words which brings it up to like 200 something if you include that but that's really just the vowelization so okay. really it's like 30 something got it that's more than syriac and arabic yeah okay um the book of ezekiel is to be read although it is not specifically indicated we believe that the reading of these biblical lessons should be continuous up to the end this assumption is based on a directive concerning the book of isaiah that is supposed to be read entirely during lent as reported both in the salma degwa and in the ma'rifat I'll, I'll read this part for you. So it's telling you to uh, read the book of Isaiah there. Okay. Little by little. These random instructions regarding readings from the prophets during Lent require further investigation. There are two possibilities. They are either simply a remnant of a local attempt by Zar uh, Zara Yaqub to enrich the liturgy of the word with Old Testament readings, or they reflect something that the Ethiopian church developed under Coptic influence following the practices of the mother church. However, it is well known that reading from the prophets during Lent has long been practiced not only in the Coptic church, but elsewhere. The prophets encourage penance, announce the imminent destruction of Jerusalem, and are to be read in preparation for the coming of Christ. However, the reform of the liturgy, a major project that was most noticeable between the end of the 14th and beginning of the 15th centuries, involved a reduction in the number of readings from the Old Testament in the liturgy of the hours and in the traditional teaching within the churchyard. Among the... the yeah. Yeah. There are two different opinions regarding the usage of the Old Testament in the liturgy of the word. Those who do not object to the including to including the Old Testament books taught in the traditional schools in the liturgy of the word and those who prefer the cautious to be cautious about including Old Testament books in the liturgy of the word especially those books which are difficult for the faithful to understand this even includes books of the New Testament the book of revelation also called Abu Qalamasis it's a it's a butchering we have you know uh, <laughs> in the yeah. arabic world how the p is read as a b uh, mm -hmm. so famously so yeah. we took that word apocalypse from the greek and they thought it was abu abu so they thought it was like some father named father of yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah that's what they thought it was yeah. is so one like one of those uh mistranslations that sticks that's but they fine. also call it Ra'i Yohannes, which is the, the revelation of John. Yeah, that's how we say it. Ru yeah. Ru yeah, no, same word. Same yeah. word. Yeah. Is one of the biblical books not read so often in the liturgy of the word during the liturgical year. It is rather a book to be read in the traditional 
Andemta. Andemta is our, um, it's like our Targum, like the Aramaic Targum mm -hmm. tradition. And we actually call it Tirguami as well. Andemta mm -hmm. is when there's more than one meaning, but the whole school is called Tirguami, which means interpretation or exegesis. Yeah, Tarjama. Yeah, yeah same, same, <laughs> same, same word. Yeah. And so that's what that is. Our, our, our school of biblical commentary or interpretation. Uh, where its meaning can be explained. It's rare use in the Qaddasi. Qaddasi is a liturgy of the word attested in the printed Mus'hafa Gesawe is a late attempt by the teachers to introduce the reading of the book of Revelation in the Qaddasi. That was your point earlier. Mm -hmm. That the ad, even the adding of the <laughs> book of Revelation was a later addition. Yeah. Some people have said that about uh, Enoch and Jubilees themselves, but somehow we preserved it. Well, look, I always thought, like, if you have Jude, you should have Enoch. Mm -hmm. We don't have Jude, and we don't have Enoch. But, um... You're consistent. You know, people, <laughs> yeah, people ask me, that. Do, are you saying it's not inspired? No, that's not what we're saying. It's inspired. Our brothers, the Ethiopians have it. The Copts have revelation. We, we, we believe that that that's like totally binding and apostolic for them and whatever. But just if you if your canons are your fast is eight weeks and my canons are my fast is seven weeks, right? So your canon is particular to your community and my canon is particular to mine. It's not a question of inspiration. It's a question of what's bound to the community there. So uh, unfortunately, we have this kind of like either Protestant or Muslim way of understanding um, like... Um, you know, the Bible in the West for some reason, because it's not intended to be like this book that fell out of the sky kind of exactly. thing. It's particular to the community. So for you to have, like we have second Baruch, I don't think you guys have second Baruch. We have 155 Psalms, I don't think you guys have that. We don't have 155, yeah. yeah we have uh, 151. Baruch, right. I think we do have, um, and we have a totally unique set of uh, Maccabees, like our Maccabees yeah. is different. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, um, than anyone else's. Yeah, it, what you're saying reminds me of. We'll shout out another Latin father, which is the the one who converted Augustine was Ambrose, and everybody mm -hmm. knows the abbreviated form. Uh, people just go when in Rome, and then they go dot dot dot. But the full quote is: When I go to Rome, I fast on Saturday, but here in Milan, I do not. Mm. Do you also follow the custom of whatever church you attend? If you do not want to give or receive scandal, and that's Saint Ambrose writing to Saint Augustine. Beautiful, yes, this is it. Um, so it's not. It's like they're they're so concerned with, like, uh, you know, a collection of books that are supposed to be in or not supposed to be in. Nobody thought about that in the early church. Nobody had these leather bound books, you know, with highlighters, uh, at home and taking them back and forth to church no if people were even literate that that's not what was happening like you go to the parish where you live you go there you hear the the word being read like we're reading right now from in the lectionary or whatever is being read to you this is how you retain it then you apply it in your life exactly and and my teachers have always said like go read them whether you have 66, 72, 81, whatever you have, go read them. Yeah. You know, uh, look at what the Lord Jesus did when he was arguing with the Sadducees who only believed in the Torah, only believed in the first five books of the Bible. Uh, he didn't quote from the Nebim. He didn't quote from the prophets. He didn't quote from the Ketubim. He didn't quote from the writings. He quoted from those first five books and said, our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the, he's the living God. He's the God of the living and not just the God of the dead. He preached the resurrection from the first five books, from the five books of Moses. And so, yeah, you use whatever you have. And even when you're in a jurisdiction, if you're wanting to, uh, I don't want to say win an argument, but, you know, be more persuasive to uh, to for the hope, as Peter says, that is inside of you. Then that's what you got to do is you got to you got to share that. Let's um let's finish this last uh, section here. Um, sure.
The Mas'afa Gis'awe, the lectionary, gives very few passages of the book of Revelation to be read during the Qadassi's Liturgy of the Word. The outstanding church scholar and very influential author of the second half of the 20th century, Malak Burhan, which means Angel of Light, it's uh, one of these administrative titles for priests, Admasu Jambare, is believed to be the one who advocated a reading of Abu Qalamasis, or uh, the Apocalypse, the Revelation, in the Qadassi. So that's very, he's a 20th century figure, by the way. I know, I know him. He's a famous uh, poet as well. Wow. He's, he's known to this day. People memorize his poetry when they're learning in the school of poetry. Um, replacing the second reading from the Catholic epistles, he did so against the majority opinion of the scholars or the Likawant who were opposed to its being read during the liturgy of the word because it is not simple enough for the people to understand. The following rubric recommends it being read on Sundays and on the Marian feasts during the celebration of the Sa'atat. Read from the book of Revelation on Sundays and on the Marian feasts. However, Holy Saturday is the only day on which the book of Revelation is read in its entirety in addition to, um, yeah, that's, that's Pascha. As, it is, as is attested by the following rubric, on the sixth hour, there it's a sixth hour thing again on the sixth hour which would be 12 of holy saturday so that's midnight uh let the people gather for the reading of the revelation of john the book of apocalypse from the beginning to the end of it so it would be read at midnight traditionally and then the eucharistic liturgy would begin and then you know people would be communing sometime around 2 a.m or 3 a.m on pascha so that's, yeah, I, I, again, I will send all of these uh, materials specifically on this Oma de Gua. I will plug right now, oxum.substack.com. My friend, as I said, Deacon Mirat, he recently published a huge thing on this Oma de Gua, which is the uh, St. Yared or St. Jared portion of Lenten hymns. And he explained the whole structure of it in excruciating detail, pun intended, because some of it talks about the nails that are in Christ and the word excruciating is connected to the to the cross of Christ. Um, as, as we just read from Professor Hapta Mikhail's work on the, the liturgy um, of hours from Abba Georgis of Sagla. That's beautiful, man. Um, yeah, please send that. I'm going to, I'm going to link your, your uh, channel. I tried to do it during this, um, I don't know if I'm just like inept or something, but I'm gonna try to do it after we're done to to link your channel on here. Um, oh, no worries, yeah, we'll text and figure it out. Yeah. Um, and uh, if there's anything else you want to share, please do. Otherwise, um, I want to thank you again, brother. I appreciate. Yeah, thank it. you for having me on. Shukran. Um, on uh, YouTube, it's P O A A S, or find me H E Nagash, and then Aksum.substack.com. You'll find me. I'm everywhere. Beautiful. All right, guys. Uh, pray for us. Like, subscribe. Uh, check out his channel. Um, I'm going to link it. He plugged. Uh, thanks again, Deacon. I appreciate you. Pray for me, huh? Likewise. All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Oh